Hello and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Today, I am very excited to bring you and introduce you to Gareth Hewitt from Lemonage. Gareth, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Uh, nice to meet you. Likewise, and, and thanks so much for coming on the show. Listen, it's uh, we've had, been having a little bit of a preamble beforehand, and uh, there's so much more I want to unpack in this episode, and some really exciting things that you guys are doing, you've been through from the, from the journey and the startup uh, voyage so far. So I'm excited about this one. Before we get into that, Gareth, tell us a little bit, if you would, about your background, uh, and introduce us to Lemonage, what you do, how you do it. Yeah, no, certainly. Um, so I'm the CEO of Lemonage. We we started this uh, in 2020, right? March 2020, just as the world locked down, and we'll kind of cover how we, we've grown since then. But my personal background is about, I spent 20 years in private equity software companies, building, um, being responsible for building or founding products that did back office partnership accounting. So like a very specialized niche. Um, but I think it's, uh, you know, we did that in over four companies over the last 20 uh, years. And every time we kind of iterated how to do it better. Um, you know, we learned everything we did wrong, everything we did right, probably most importantly, every other comp everything every other company did wrong and the, what they did right, and how to do all of that better. Uh, and we had the fortune of really doing a joint partnership with one of the top 10 most complex fund accounting firms on the planet in the prior five years of starting this company, um, and actually working from within their organization instead of being a software company working from the outside in. Um, and so that really um, made us so correctly for this industry. And all of that was put into, into this new product and the local platform that supports it. What I think is particularly relevant though, is you know in private capital, the story is that there's two or three incumbents of buyers that are 20 year old legacy tech that are just not fit for purpose in the industry anymore. Um, but that story of 20 year old legacy suppliers, you know, being dominating, dominating by two or three um, large companies in this vertical for back office accounting is true, I think, across a lot of verticals in financial services. So mm. whether it's insurance or tax modeling or credit derivatives or syndicated loans, you know, all of these areas are serviced by two or three incumbent suppliers that are very large and aren't really fit for purpose like they were 20 years ago um, and that's why we took the approach of creating a local platform we think you know we can solve phenomenally well for within the private capital industry but we think we have a platform that can help solve across all these other verticals as well I think that's been a real feature of the last couple of years, hasn't it? The sort of rise of, um, you know, for want of a better expression, boutique businesses who are, who are much more agile uh, and able to disrupt, a, you know, a, a, an industry that has been, you know, very legacy orientated. And I think, you know, be it the pandemic or be it just increasing digitalization in our day to day world, that, that sort of desire for instant gratification and, and hyper personalization to the way that you're use, utilizing your tech. That seems to have been a perfect time to, you know, to kick off and, and disrupt industries where legacy incumbents who haven't necessarily innovated quite as quickly to provide that that's that, that real tailored solution to people is that what is that was that the inspiration behind everything for you yeah i think so i think there's a number of factors that go into it I think you're you're right um increasing digitization i think there's also a more educated um buyer market you mm. know 20 years ago when people were installing these first wave of financial services systems that hooked into their back office accounting they were moving off of paper essentially you know that and and so the bar wasn't really that high but now you've got a, a market of of buyers who are used to you know everything working in apps on phones and they're like why is this technology 20 years behind the times yeah. You know, why, why is this technology servicing my my loans or my my back office accounting taking nine months or 18 months to implement and got all this complexity with where whereas I would expect data integration, reporting, auditing, security, and all the rest, all these things to work. But in these legacy systems, they they tend not to. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting sort of opportunity that sort of presented itself, and and you know the the the, uh, the timing of it that you mentioned and, and sort of nodded towards beforehand is really interesting, isn't it? Because uh, 
you were telling me that beforehand you've spent sort of five years out in the uh, in the states. You come back to you know to launch this uh, for, you know from London, take advantage of the network. And uh, what was it, the fifteenth of March that you arrived at, arrived back yeah. in London? Fifteenth of March, you arrived back in London. Two days later, we're in, we're in lockdown. How does that start a uh, uh, you know identifies the perfect time to start a uh, a business? <laughs> what a, what a challenge that must have been for you. It was obviously, yeah, it was obviously very interesting for us. I mean, the, the initial plan when we started was just to spend that first nine months or so building out the platform, building out the product. So it was always going to be the case that for a while we were going to be concentrated and working from home. So in a way that kind of suited us because any initial conversations we had, you know, with everyone else in their offices, they also were working from home and on Zoom. So it didn't, you know, it, we looked the same, even though yeah. we were a startup working from from our bedrooms at that point in time. Um, but uh, so I think I think that worked for us, and it certainly worked for us when we started to hire. We you know we didn't have offices, we didn't have any of those expenses, um, and so we were able to say, well, we don't need to necessarily hire right in London. We can hire throughout the whole of the UK, and the same for. The US, we don't have to hire in New York, we can hire from the whole of the US. Mm. Um, and so it made us, you know, cast a wider net for talent um, and for a startup looking particularly for the niches that we were looking for, that, that made hiring uh, a, a little bit easier. Um, it was certainly different making all your first hires remotely. So, you know, when we eventually met up, Six months later, everyone's you know taller or shorter than you imagine. <laughs> it's amazing <laughs> that, isn't it? <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, so I think it definitely had some positives. Definitely um, made some things easier for us. I think initially when we started the company, I also envisaged heavily networking around London, and that didn't transpire obviously because we were locked down. But the flip side to that is you can make you know eight Zoom meetings in a day as initial contacts. Whereas you can only make two or three meetings in London driving around in taxis. So that kind of worked for us as well. So it's one of those sort of situations where when life gives you lemons, make lemonage. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> very pleased with, couldn't, very pleased couldn't with that one. Myself. Very <laughs> pleased with that one. But I love that whole concept of, uh, of, of uh, sort of taking the adversity of it and actually turning it into a positive. And there's been so many positives that people have taken from this from a business perspective to adapt and find a completely new way of, of working. Had you, had you been uh, working to remote models historically for yourself or looked at I've engaging kind of remote talent? I've worked in small companies, like either I founded them or you know, worked um, with, co-founded them or uh, the initial company I started out 20 years ago was only four people when I joined. Um, so I've always, not necessarily remote working, but always small teams. And yeah. where the flexibility was there as if you were remote working, right? You know, yeah, yeah. It didn't necessarily matter exactly what hours you did in the office. Everyone was going to be working lots of hours anyway. So, you know, you could be late or you could be early um, or you could work from home for days if you wanted to. And, and no one would really question those things. So the disadvantages that, that were thrown at you have been flipped into to positives. Uh, from the story, it's been a you know it's it's been a, a rapid a rapid start, and and there's been you know significant investment from significant partners. Tell us a little bit about your you know, your, your capital raises and and uh, and how that's been going for you as well. Yeah, I think you know we probably have a slightly different story on that because our our clients or some of our target clients are venture capital funds and private equity funds. So we're by our very nature within the industry that typically you would have to reach out to. Um, so once we, we kind of finalized the product and got it to a point where we wanted to start shouting about it and showing people heavily towards the end of 2020. Um, and very quickly, there was um, a lot of interest. It became apparent to us that raising money wouldn't be an issue. And what we really wanted to do was make sure there was strategic alignment um, for us. Um, from the partners that we would be bringing on board. And we definitely wanted investment versus doing it organically. Mm. Um, you know, we knew the industry. We also knew that what we wanted to do was accelerate as much as we could very quickly before legacy competitors would have time to kind of react to us. Um, 
So we found a, a fair amount of uh, New York Psychic partners. They're a small um, VC, they were our lead investor. Um, there was a lot of strategic alignment for us with their um, investor base and who we were trying to target and everything else that worked for us. And we also had the luxury of finding two other strategic partners to invest alongside. One was Tikon Bersan, who founded Parse.com, Scribe.com, is heavily influenced, uh, heavily involved in Y Combinator. Um, and one of those was a local platform that he built um, for the, in the mobile phone space, which gave us credibility to the local platform that we were trying to create within accounting and financial services. Um, particularly towards the complex end of financial service transactions. Uh, and the other was Laura Nisevich. Um, she was the founder of Investran. Um, Investran does back office accounting for private equity. So in that niche, they're certainly one of our main competitors. Uh, and so having her come along on uh, side as not only an investor, but a daily strategic advisor, added a ton of credibility to what we were doing in the private capital space. Um, you know, she's well renowned and uh, and recognized in that industry. And a lot of the initial conversations we were having with large potential clients knew of her, or were either either knew of her or were using Investran. So having the founder of that company explain why, you know, your, our technology is the future and is better than the the legacy technology she founded helped uh, you know helped us get our message across in the industry. So important that is, isn't it? To, to, you know, to, when, when you talk there about strategic advisors, I think there's been. Um, I'm always interested about the statistics behind, you know, sort of investment and, and VC and capital plays, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, about, um, you know, how many, how many, are, the, the, you know, what's what's the secret behind the ones that go so well? And I think a lot of it is there is a, is about making sure that the people who you're working with are aligned to where you want to go, and it's not just a sort of a hedge of bet, you know, effectively that people are taking, but it's something there which works for all parties. That seems to be something that, that strategically you were you were really considered about. Yeah, I think, you know, I think one of the things learned over the last 20 years is I'm a big believer in aligning incentives, you know, making yeah. sure everyone's aligned to it to the same goal and there's no kind of conflicts along that, you know, helps everyone understand where they're going and what they're trying to achieve and uh, what we're all working for. And so, you know, we we didn't just want money. We wanted to make sure that everyone was involved, could help us and aid us on that journey. Um, you know, we were walking into the industry, into an industry that typically doesn't deal with startups. You know, you have to be, a, it's a catch-22 situation. You have to be established for them to work with you, but you can't get established if you're a startup and they they want to wait two, three years to see if you're still around. So we had to build a, a very senior team that was very knowledgeable and expert in the industry and also make sure we had that from our investors and advisors um, so that um, when we were talking to clients, they'd already heard about us, they knew who we were working with, they knew the credibility of not only us, but the people we were bringing on board. Um, and so all of that had to align. Um, and you know, I think there's a lot that goes into making all that work, but certainly making sure you're always aligning incentives helps. And then, and then most recently, obviously as well, we've just had the uh, the news about the investment from Blackstone, which is significant. Tell, tell us a little bit about how that's uh, come about and what the you know, what the intentions are. Yeah, so, you know, we raised the initial round Q1 of 2021. So just after we you know, launched the product and that was to accelerate our growth. You know, the product was there, it was ready for the industry. We just needed to scale the company. Um, and it typically takes about nine months or so to make a, a sale in this enterprise software space. Um, so we were building up the tech team, training them up, getting everything geared to our, our first set of clients, which we um, landed in Q4 uh, 2021. So um, we got our first set, about four or five clients. We're bringing them on board. I think one of them was announced. Um, but uh, as part of that process, we found we were talking to some very large um, investment firms. Um, one of those was Blackstone. You know, we went through a process showing them everything we were doing, how we could transform their operations. Um, and it, you know, we weren't looking for more investment, but again, to the earlier point, what we were looking for was strategic alignment. Um, you know, making for, sure we bring the right type of partners on board and you don't get a better partner than Blackstone. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they have a, such a diverse 
uh, array of assets. They're so big in terms of their understanding and complexity. Um, and uh, their name is, you know, industry recognized. So Definitely. as we were chat talking with them, it became apparent, you know, there's an opportunity to extend that seed round um, that we close at the beginning of the year, of the year and bring them on board uh, and work with them as a partner. And obviously, um, there's a lot of benefits that we can bring to Blackstone and there's a lot of uh, knowledge and benefits that they can bring to us as a platform. And so we wanted to make sure that that um, opportunity didn't go by. And so to your point, exactly, we managed to uh, work with Blackstone, bring them on board. I think we raised a total of uh, just over $4 million um, by that seed extension, mm -hmm. which all closed, as you say, just towards the end of 2021. So in that in that first year, we managed to raise just uh, close to about $7 million, which obviously gives us a tremendous platform to make sure that we deliver for our clients and make a big impact across the market and scale as a company over this year. I mean, we're um, 18 people right now. We'll be 30 by the end of March, um, mm -hmm. and we'll probably be 60 or 90 towards the end of the year. Um, so we have a... We have a, a great kind of position and um, backing to, to make sure we can make that happen. Was that when you started it, Gareth, back in uh, March 2020? Was that something which you envisaged that sort of scale of growth, that rate of growth, or is it? Um, I think we always knew we were going to get there. I mean, you have to, you have to believe you're going to get there if you're going to yeah, create yeah. a startup, um, and you know it's a lot of work. You, don't know exactly when that timing is going to happen. Um, and uh, so I don't know if we thought we'd be there in a, a year, two years, or five years. Um, and obviously, VC funding helps accelerate all of that yeah, yeah. time frame. But, uh, but yeah, we, we always thought we'd be able to get there. But certainly, the closing $7 million in, in a year um, certainly accelerated that. Accelerated it's everything. Not exactly what we thought would happen, but it certainly made this. Uh, a lot easier that's just an outstanding story isn't it and and i love the fact that you, that you mentioned that look, we weren't necessarily looking for funding at that sort of stage and and then uh, you raise it at that sort of level it's a tremendous uh, i guess uh, nod that things are in the right direction and the products needed and 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 you've got the validation of someone you know who, who really helps fuel everything else that's uh, that's in in there as well what do you what do you think you know when you look at that and you think you're right you, you know why that you know the strategic advisors what is it about the company that, that has made you so investable at such an early stage like i say i think we this isn't the first time we've done it we've done it in the we've never had investors before but we've worked with a lot of these massive companies over the last 20 years we know what they look for we know what they want to see um you know if you compare to a typical startup it might be people out of college or with an idea or the rest, whereas we mm. were coming to that um, position, not with an idea, not with um, some knowledge of the industry, but we were coming to that position as experts in the industry. We mm. were coming to that position, having done it for 20 years um, with a lot of knowledgeable people working with us. And we, were, and we had a product, we had a market, we had a plan, we had a proven, um, uh, way to, to get into that market. And we had the fact that it was a, a local financial services platform, which also meant we could go into completely other verticals as well. Um, so there was a lot that we were showing to investors, which, you know, ticked all the boxes that we knew that they were looking for anyway. Um, yeah. And so I think that definitely makes us investable. You know, we, we had a as I said before, with Laura Nisovich and, and TCON, you know, we were making sure that everything that we did added credibility to who we are and our story so that the initial set of clients that are working with us get that validation as well. You know, mm -hmm. that they're making the right choice. They're working with a company that's going to be around and is going to grow and is going to accelerate and is going to support yeah. them. So it's about making sure all of that aligns. But I think, you know, our investability certainly comes from a lot of the credibility of what we're doing, that we've done it before, that we're known in the industry, that we actually have technology we can prove to them um, is a generational leap over everything else in the industry. So that let's, let's, let's talk about that. Sorry to, to cut in, because I, I do think you know, there's, there's so much happening with uh, 
you know, that low code, no code sort of space at the moment. And we're seeing you know, more and more innovation driven, you know, driven through that. You mentioned there about you know, how we're different, how we're sort of changing the game in a, in a space there, which is obviously a big part of investment, isn't it? Is there a scalable market? We've got, yeah. um, you know, yeah, uh, you know, scope size, et cetera. Are we in, you know, someone mentioned it to me the other day, are we, are we in the, uh, are we in the business of selling unicycles or have we got something a little bit bigger than that? And uh, I think you, you, you're onto something a little bit bigger, but I'm really intri intrigued about the sort of you know, differentiators that you've got technically and because and, uh, you're doing something pretty special there as well. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I think, I mean, we've got a number. I think the first part is that we have this low-code platform for financial services. What we really wanted to go about is saying that, you know, having done this for 20 years, we knew how to solve for the private capital space in a, in a new way that would provide a lot of differences. And I'll, I'll go into that in a minute. But, but really, about 80% of what we were doing there, if you generalized it, was applicable to the whole of financial services. The problems are similar about auditing, compliance, reporting, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the complex financial transactions, you know, all the rest of it. Um, so building a platform that had all of that built in meant that, you know, we could work with partners and within a month, you know, 20 times faster than, than anyone else, build out solutions for credit, you know, syndicated loans or risk, credit risk rating agencies or um, policy administration systems and insurance, you know, and that's, that's what we're working on doing throughout this year is, is, is working with partners um, to build that on the platform. Um, so the differentiator is there's lots of, as you said, no code platforms out there um, and they are being used in financial services. And I think Gardner has a survey saying something like, I forget exactly what the numbers are, but um, by the end of 2030, you know, every major financial services institution will have at least like two no code or low code platforms, mm. which is a massive change from where they are right now, which is only 20% or something of it, right? Yes, 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 um, yes. And so it's, a, it's about saying that that technology can kind of transform. And the differentiator for us is a lot of these technologies are built towards like data or workflow. Whereas what we have is, you know, an integrated multi-currency, multi-ledger, general ledger accounting engine for complex financial services uh, transactions that involve you know, hundreds of different legal vehicles, scattered throughout the world. So we're really kind of targeting a niche of complexity within financial services and saying we have an engine around it, a platform around it that you can build on. And, and every system that's kind of tied into that space is typically a 20 year old legacy system that they can't yeah. move off of because it's so critical to what they do is tied into that general ledger accounting space. So we're unique in that space, um, I think within the, the low code space. And then we built our private equity solution on top of that. And so we're offering a lot in the, in the industry in private equity that isn't there before. We have modeling scenario tools that just work out of the box and give you an, an instant copy of your entire system. Doesn't matter if it's 200 gigabytes or 200 terabytes. And you can have as many of those um, copies to play with of live data as you want, which solves a huge amount of modeling, forecasting, scenario planning for financial services. Um, and then we have algorithm tools and other local tools that let you kind of take the benefits of Excel and build calculation engines on your system in a way that's fully auditable, fully transparent, fully reportable. So um, all of that is just a generational leap over where they are today, where you have to work with a vendor and you know get billed out at two, three thousand pounds a day to, to build out things. And, and this is about saying that clients can do it for themselves. It's incredible, isn't it? And it's, uh, you know, when we, when we talk about those investable businesses, you, know, you, you mentioned there the credibility of the team that's been, you know, that aren't fly by night and have been there and done it beforehand. But it's, you know, that, that sort of genuine, you know, well, it's perfect or disrupt, isn't it? When you look at, uh, at, you know, at where scalability is. And I think there's probably a little bit of both in, in, what, you're, in what you're talking about with, with this, just to allow a better need in a scalable thing, you know, scalable issue that everyone has that can, can can suddenly change the game and improve it for them. So what's so so where does it go for you now? What's the you mentioned you know the, the sort of uh, hyper growth that you're looking at over the course of this this year? I imagine there's yeah there's this sort of um, continuation of the 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 innovation in the products and such like. What what's uh, what's the rest of uh, 2022 and beyond hold for you? I think the the main thing this year is to 
to deal with our, our growth and uh, our onboarding of clients. So, you know, our initial set of clients is making sure that, you know, we over deliver on everything for those clients and also the, the new clients that we'll be bringing on this year. Um, we are still a startup, no matter where we are right now. Um, and so making sure that every client in the industry is raving about why we're different, why we're better, et cetera, um, you know, we got to scale to deliver upon all of that. Um, so it's really about solidifying that foundation so that when we go into 2021, people know who we are and what we've done and what we've delivered on them. It's not just that we're saying something, it's that we can do it. Um, so that's kind of the first thing for this year is, is betting all that down. Um, and then at the same time, exploring these other opportunities in different, in different verticals. And do you stay a uh, a remote business? Is that is that on the agenda? I mean, it's it's uh, you know when you're there and starting up, it's that nimble ability to sort of bring people in from you know a sort of diverse and, and wider catchment area. As you sort of grow a business, and you're talking about some of the numbers that you've had, sometimes that can um, you know create more challenges as well as more opportunity around it. Is, do, do you see the uh, the future being hubs or or um, you know individual offices offices again, or is this going to be a uh, a remote a, a remote play? It's an interesting question. I mean, for us, um, you know, we didn't have the legacy of having an office or anything else. So yeah. we, we started during the pandemic. And the consequence of that, as we said, was that we hired not necessarily where we would have ordinarily hired before. Um, that also means we now have a team that's, you know, more geographically dispersed than they would have been had we hired around London and New York. Mm -hmm. So even if we were to get an office, in either of those places, you know, not everyone can make it in anyway. Make it in, yeah, yeah. Um, so we're in a situation where I think, to your point, the, the middle ground is we'll probably have hubs. We'll have um, hubs at some point where people, if they want to, can come in and teams can come in at certain times and, and you know, there'll be that hot desking available and if people want to be there all the time, they can. People want to be there a day or two a week or if people don't want to go there and they can just come in once a month, well, that'll mm. have to work as well. Um, so I think it's supporting the model that we, we've built out and not changing it, I think is important. And so that's probably what we'll head towards. It does mean, you know, we're not getting offices, but we are focusing a lot on making sure that that culture is still there. Yeah. You know, everyone worries about, um, you know, you don't have that interact activity and all the rest. So we're making sure that not only do we have virtual get togethers, but we have real physical get togethers every month or two and um, try and bring everyone together and make sure all of that's um, still happening, even though we don't have an office. You know, it's, a, it's something that I think you have to actively work on. You can't just assume it'll happen because it, it won't. Um, but I think that's a small price to pay for the flexibility that you give everyone by saying, you know, you can work from home. Yeah, yeah. That that culture aspect is, you know, is the big question, isn't it? When when you see this, when we think, you know, there's so many remote, you know, remote first businesses that have uh, have grown recently and even before this as well. I think it, you know, people sort of think that that uh, remote working and companies scaling without actually having offices is is a, is a post pandemic thing, but it's been happening for you know for for, for a long long time, yeah. right? And uh, and and this this is you know, it, I guess one of the big benefits has been that sort of access to talent. How how spread is it? I mean, you mentioned there about getting people into it. Is it sort of like uh, you know, let's take London as a for example. Have you got people throughout the UK and Europe, or is it just uh, is it is it? We got uh, we got. I mean, my the co-founder Jamie um, uh, started with this with me for in uh, March of 2020 from the sales and marketing side. You know, he's in Europe. Um, in uh, Utrecht near Amsterdam. Um, I would say in the UK, people are anywhere up to about three or so plus hours out of London. You know, the kind yeah. of thing where it's not commutable, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, in the US, it's, it's more diverse, as you can probably imagine. You know, there are multiple different states away and all yeah, the exactly rest. Right, just not gonna. Uh, well, it's more set up for that out there as well, isn't it? I mean, that 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 is commonplace. You know, when you when you look at it, uh, you know, from there as well, there's a, there's a lot more. Well, to, to be fair, I guess in the states, there's a lot more people who move around a little bit more than than you you would yeah. potentially see. But also, it's uh, you know, it's, it, it's companies have been set for that for a long time out there. I think, haven't they as well? 
yeah, very, very interesting. And it's a, and, and would you would you have designed it as a as a remote business when you were when you first envisaged coming back here, or has, um, that, been a ha- has that been a happy byproduct of uh, of what's happened? I think it's probably been a happy byproduct. We we like I said, we would have still had that nine or so months where we just worked from our bedrooms, you know, got everything sorted. Um, but we would have been networking in London. We would have at some point said, you know, let's get an office in London, you know, which I've done before with other companies. You know, you have that startup phase, you start getting a few clients, you get an office and you end up hiring around, making sure that people can get to the office. Mm. Um, we would have still had what I've had in previous companies where I said, where people could still work from home, it would have been more relaxed about hours and all the rest of it, but we would have been hiring within that commutable distance. Um, whereas I think this just opened up the opportunity to say, well, it's, that doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fascinating. I, I love, I love this story, and I love the, uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of growth. And and it's, look, it sounds like there's a uh, a plan here that's going to go go, you know, go through the roof over the next uh, you know next couple of months, years, and uh, and and such like. If you were to look back at it and say, right, here's a couple of the, the golden lessons that I can take away from what we've been through, what we've learned, uh, what we've picked up over this sort of, sort of phase, and someone who's just at that sort of entry level now, just about to kick off their you know their, their first business in the space. What would, you, what would you say the biggest lessons you've learned would be? It's a big um, one to throw at you that as well, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't think there's, you know, many, you know, I think it's just, like, we have lessons certainly about startups. The COVID thing, I think we've kind of covered in terms of like hiring remotely and all the rest, you know, that, that yeah. was all new. But everything else, you know, the advice I've always got is, you know, just do it as early as you can. You know, the earlier you do something, the the better the mm. the longer you wait the harder it is to you know you'll have more obligations and everything else it's always hard to create a startup um the younger you are the easier that is you know one of the things that you kind of have to really work on is making yourself redundant it's mm. kind of like really hard because you're starting a company and so you do everything um, and you want to do everything because it's your vision, you know how it should work, you know exactly what needs to be done, um, and it takes time to train others to do that. But equally, the more you hold on to something, the more you can't do anything else. Yeah. Um, and so you have to, you have to step back and, and divide it up as much as you can because you'll never be able to do other things if you're doing everything. Fantastic. So Gareth, look, there's um, there's there's a load of value that's that's come through this. I think you know one of the big things for me is is uh, you look at it and you think, right, good, uh, experienced team who know what they're talking about in a marketplace that's got growth and, and attacking a problem that's uh, you know, that's clearly there and visible to see in the in the marketplace that creates real real value and a real solution. So it's no wonder to me that the investments come in. Um, you know, whenever I speak to a, you know, to anyone in PE or a, a VC or an investor in any way, shape, or form, there's about two or three things they're looking for, and they buy the people first and their experience. Then they look at the the, you know, the product market fit and size, size and scale, and then the you know the viable product. So, you know, um, Lemonade just got something there which I think is is hugely investable and and uh, hugely exciting about where it goes from here. So, with people watching this, who should be speaking to you? What sort of people should be uh, reaching out to you at the moment? Um, Tell us, tell us how who should who should be in touch and how should they get hold of you? Absolutely. I mean, I think you know we are making an impact, but we're still relatively unknown as a startup. Um, and I think you know we 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 kind of envisaged initially that we would be selling to private capital firms that weren't running the legacy systems because they were obviously the easiest choice. We wouldn't have to compete. We'd take them off Excel or whatever they're doing. But what we found is. Um, most of the firms, if they're five billion plus, they've got legacy systems, but they want to get off them. They've just never been able to because there's only two or three suppliers and they all have the same kind of problems attached to them. So there's no value in switching to the same, you know, a different supplier with a, the same set of problems, just a slightly different flavor. So we actually found that all of our traction is coming from the, you know, five billion, some of the largest firms in terms of GPs, LPs, fund of funds, fund admins. You know, all these systems that are running the Efron, Investran, all of you legacy systems um, have a lot of problems. I think it was probably best captured by a phrase like uh, Lauren Isovich, uh, 
um, co-founder of Investram, but also our investor strategic advisor always says is, you know, an educated buyer or an educated consumer is our best client. So people in the industry who have gone through all these legacy systems, they know all the problems, they know what's actually needed in the industry, get it as soon as we show it to them. You know, they immediately get it and they immediately see a path about how they can move off of these legacy systems and onto this new one that's actually solves for their problems. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like I say, it's not small or new firms, which probably is traditionally what a startup would go for. It's the, it's the older, more experienced firms that are large that are, we're actually finding the most traction with. So big GPs, LPs, funded funds, fund admins, secondaries, you know, we're, we're solving for all their problems and they, and they get it. That's a nice pitch to have, isn't it, when you're selling? <laughs> yeah. And Gareth, how should I get in touch with you? Uh, our website and our LinkedIn, you know, where we are uh, actively, you know, promoting that as much as possible on lemonedge.com and on, on LinkedIn at Lemon Edge. Uh, but reaching out to us, you know, where we reply pretty much immediately to everyone and, and set up demonstrations and take them through uh, uh, everything we do. Fantastic. Well, Gareth, listen, it's been an absolute joy. What a great way to start a week hearing something as inspiring as your, your story so far. It's, uh, it's been a huge amount of fun. Great hearing what you've been up to. And uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to sharing this far and wide and, uh, and seeing the response. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. No, thank you very much. And thank you all for watching. We will see you soon on another episode of Fintech Focus TV. Thanks a lot.